I mean, personally is how to uh, format those scenarios. Um, are they too technical? And you, you point out they were, and I think you were right. Um, so I started changing that up a little bit, getting some advice in the clean code forum. Um, so right now, I, what I started doing is adding a uh, scenario. So we have a first endpoint is forward slash countries is our rest endpoint. And that's a, a new endpoint we're creating in Node. And so there's a Jira story for that. Um, we're going to return stub data for it. I can actually, actually show you some of the screen that makes it easier for well, you. Well, so before we, before we go down uh, this road, so mm -hmm. as I recall, um, you know, we, we, where we had kind of left things was, um, was me saying, I'm not sure you're in a position to do BDD at all. Yeah, um, and 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 you know, part of that is a uh, part of the reason that I didn't want to go much farther um, without being able to talk to you directly is because when we start, you know, I I get increasingly nervous around people who come to me saying I want to do BDD um, without getting into what do you really think you mean by that yeah. and why do you care at all. So I want to go there before we go much further. Sure. Um, so the, the headline, just like I said before, is um, you're, it sounds like you're already in a position where um, you're essentially building, you're in this weird mixture between being an infrastructure team and being a feature team because you're building the back end for features. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So we, we, we know from you know, vast experience that uh, infrastructure teams tend not to work, um, that it, it works well when there is a group of people who work with feature teams who are, uh, pay more attention to the infrastructure, to common infrastructure and try to encourage uh, common standards across the teams you yeah. need you need sort of someone to look that stuff over mm -hmm. but if we try to pool that into a single team then you create bottlenecks because now you're creating handoffs between you know you end up either with a feature team that is waiting for an infrastructure team to get around to work that they need to do yeah. or you end up with the two feature teams doing two feature teams both needing the same thing both not being willing to wait or one's willing to wait and the other's not willing yeah, to wait. Exactly. They end up then building some weird Franken version of what they both need. Right. It's not coordinated. And then even if they try to contribute that back to the infrastructure, uh, the, the effort involved in cleaning and unifying that can actually be more than the effort to just support two different things. So that's, and it, it sounds, whenever I hear of sort of this uh, front end, back end, separation like this across teams, it makes me worry about the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I bring that up more to illustrate why I would even say, based on what you've told me so far, um, and with the, uh, the picture I have in my head of what it means to do BDD, mm -hmm. I would say drop the idea entirely, seriously, you know, read about it, yeah. uh, talk to other people about it, but recognize that you're 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 setting yourself up to bang your head against a wall that's just going to leave your head bloody. Yeah. If you try to pursue this, so then the question becomes not how how can we do P, how can we do BDD, right. but more uh, what could what could BDD have to teach us that we might find useful? Yeah. Right. So I just so I guess where I'd like to go now is. What? Let's even start with why do you think you want to do BDD on this stuff at all? So what? Assuming that we could wave the mat, wave the magic wand, and you could do BDD perfectly, whatever yeah. that means to you. Yep. What do you think you'd get out of it? So what do you think you'd get out of it that would be practical for this situation? So I, I, I look at it as I could use it in any situation, but that's just my own opinion. But the, the two right, and, and that's and so and so. Let me stop you there yeah. then then in your position, I would be looking for opportunities to practice doing BDD not on this work. Okay. Because it sounds like the, like the, the to me, one of the essential parts of, of doing BDD is having control. To me, if you don't have control over deciding what features you're going to do, mm -hmm. 
BDD is pointless. Um, now there are some parts of BDD that are still helpful, right? Like the, the writing scenarios. Yeah. Uh, that stuff is always going to be helpful, but that's right. just testing. I mean, that's just ultimately the mechanics of that is exactly the same as writing tests for TDD. Just the purpose of those tests is yeah, slightly and that's different. what I, I gain a benefit from, from is having that higher layer of acceptance criteria in our stories. Right. For so me, I think the one done. thing that you can, the one thing that I think you could probably benefit from BDD, and you don't even need to go BDD all the way to BDD to get this, is. Um, to make sure that you is to avoid the typical mistake of trying to use the same set of tests for both. I feel confident that we're building the right that we're building the API correctly, mm -hmm. and I feel confident that this API is usable and addresses the front end's concerns. I think yeah. one of the biggest one of the ways that separating TDD and BDD in your head can help is to keep these two sets of tests separate. There may be some slight overlap between them and that's okay. Yeah. But to really understand when you've got the hat on that says, I'm writing tests because I want to get feedback about the correctness of my code and, right. the, and the suitability of my design. And the other hat, which is I'm writing, I'm automating examples so that I can run the system and get confidence that I'm marching in the direction of building what they think they asked yeah, me Yeah, yeah, I, I get that point. It drives your, okay. your lower level tests. I totally get that. Perfect. Um, it's going to be very general, but they drive the set of unit tests you ultimately create. Right. create this, this, and as the, yeah. and I, so that's that. what ultimately led me to, in your position, I would strongly recommend do not try to do, do not try to write your end-to-end -end <laughs> tests in Gherkin. I would say just, yeah. you know, it's, it's funny because I, I really like it. <laughs> no, no, but but I mean, Gherkin is yeah. just not a really good. It's not a really good programming language. I mean, it's a it's a good, it's a good oh, pseudo programming yeah. language for. It's a good pseudo programming language for encouraging us to articulate our features precisely. That's what I'm talking about. That part. But it's a terrible programming language. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm not using it as a programming language. I'm just literally copying those sentences into my Mocha. Tests. Right. So exactly. So there was. Uh, yeah. Have you ever, since you've worked with Eighth Light, um, did they ever? Um, did they? Did you? Have you ever seen uh, Fit or Fitness? Yes, we tried using it at first, and, and then they cut it off from Eighth Light, and so they didn't want any BDD at all. And they they, have, they had no clue they're talking about. We we didn't get a chance. We did a little bit of fitness. That's right. it. You know. Uh, yeah, and, I think I know the idea. So, so there was. Have you ever heard of um, J Web Fit? No, no, I have not. Okay, so the short version is um, 10 years ago when Fit and Fitness were really much more popular, um, you know, people were writing a bunch of, of uh, plugins and add ons for them to be able to do different kinds of testing. And yeah. one of them was called JWeb Fit, which was essentially um, uh, uh, the, the integration of an HTTP client that happened to be written in Java with the Java version of fitness. And the idea was that you could write your test tables with um, HTTP client commands. Okay. You know, issue this get request, uh, get the value, you so know, they tried, they tried to the do response. Like, try to do Selenium in there or something, like, you know, like a, uh, Yeah, very yeah. similar to Selenium, yeah. Capybara, things like that. Okay. So the one nice thing about JWebFit was um, I have an HTTP client in my, you know, I have an HTTP client that doesn't require me to write code. It's essentially like writing little scripts. Imagine writing uh, uh, tests in uh, uh, HTTP client tests in a kind of scripting language. Okay. Um, the bad news was that I saw teams doing crazy things like saying, well, now the cool thing is we can do, they would say ATDD, but we can do BDD now. Mm -hmm. um, and our testers and our programmers don't have to talk to each other because the testers can just write their own test scripts. Yeah. And the programmers don't have to write any glue code between the tests and the application. Yeah. Which really means that they were just going back to, hey, let's use JWebFit as a test automation language. Well, if you're going to just write it, if you're just going to use a test automation language, there are much better test automation languages than JWebFit. There's you know Ruby, Python, Java, C Sharp, yeah. uh, with all kinds of great HTTP client libraries. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to go the route of doing crazy things like using QTP and stuff like that, fine, do that. Yeah. Um, 
But I mean, as as that's kind of where I feel like what I saw from what you were telling me was um, I would put my energy on uh, finding a platform that makes it really easy for you to write. Uh, that that provides a really easy to use REST client. Yeah, I, I've, found client. That, I've found that. Close. And then just and just write your end-to-end -end tests using that. And what you'll end up doing is if you re, you know if you remove duplication from those tests, you'll end up with this nice little library that's perfectly customized for your team working with them. Um, it has the features you care about. You might end up you know recreating something like HTML unit or HTTP unit or something like that. Until creating your own like like REST service. Like what do you mean specifically? Like um... well, so you, so if you just start with raw HTTP client and write tests, okay. you're going to notice that there's patterns in the way that you write those tests. Some of those patterns will have to do with the fact that you're testing a REST API instead of a more generic web application. Okay. Some of those patterns will have to do with. Um, this is the way we organize our services. This is uh, these are naming conventions we use in our URIs yeah. or in our parameter names or things like that. Right. Um, so there'll be some there'll be some duplication that comes from we're doing things uh, restfully. There'll be some duplication from here are some conventions that we've developed as a group that go beyond REST, but are the way we use REST, yeah. the way we use HTTP. Right. And what you'll end up with is instead of trying to reuse some high-level REST testing library that's based on how somebody else did things, you'll end up essentially creating a little, almost like a little DSL or a little, it doesn't have to be a DSL, but a little library that reflects, here's how we do things. Right. Okay. And so that's cool because you'll be able to detect when you're not adhering to your own conventions because the tests will be harder to write. Well, what? why is this test different from the last 27 of them? Ah, oh, we're doing this new thing. Well, is this new thing something we want to do or is this new thing at odds with how we've been doing it yeah, and right. should we change the way we've been doing it or is that just there's a new guy and you know he hasn't figured out how we do things yet or yeah. we got an idea you know we had an idea in our head we forgot what our conventions were maybe we want to go back to this that kind of thing. So okay. Uh, so that that's sort of my that's my um, rough opinion about based on what you've said so far mm -hmm where I think you should go. Okay. So now, uh, tell me what worries you about that, what you're concerned about, what you think you'd miss out on, why you think it's a bad idea, any of that kind of stuff, and see. Yeah. And, that, and that, I think, what my, my style is sort of, that'll surface additional questions yeah. and weirdnesses, okay. and we'll figure out what to do there. Sounds so good. what do you think about all that? Uh, so I'm trying to be cognizant of the fact that uh, I've got a friend who, who is really into BDD and he's very good at it. Um, he runs an XP shop, and I'm trying yeah. to learn from him. Right? It's hard. You don't have anybody to learn from. So yeah. um, you can do it, but you know, are you doing it right? And it matters to do it right to a certain degree, right? So, um, anyways, I don't want to overtest. So um, in my layers below, my my lower level tests, people have overtested. You know that mistake, and that's why everybody's going back to BDD, higher level to drive your test down more right. lean, right, and more s s focused to the business behavior. So I'm, I'm trying to, that's why I'm going to BDD, is to, for two reasons, um, to scope my stores out so I know I'm done, right? and to, to scope my lower level tests to be what they really should be aimed for, which is behavior. So those are the two reasons I'm doing it. I, I still feel like I can do it on the rest of the API or anything I'm working on. I don't, I'm not concerned with the UI. I'm not working on the UI. I don't care about Selenium, right. all that junk. Um, right now, I just care about. Uh, I've got my contract. I'm using Coa.js, which is a Node, you know, REST. Uh, I mean, it's just a Node web service, and I, I just want to test that outer contract that's being exposed. Okay. And so I figured my stories should be based on requirements around that contract, and those requirements I'm getting from is the web team when they want to get data from my API. So I'm trying to figure out how to create these scenarios. One more story, so I know I'm done. So I'm driving what they need, and that's the hard part. Yeah. So do you end up kind of in a situation where um, you and the UI team essentially have the same set of stories? So because that's usually what happens, right? Yes. There's uh, the 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 UI team or the 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 two of you together. Yep. Are delivering the features exactly what's going on. He's, he's got and so you have a single pipeline of stories, mm -hmm. and essentially every story comes down. Every story really comes down to 
Each of us works on our part of the story, yep. and then we integrate them later. Yeah, we both have separate stories, but they're based on a component that we both support. Create. He's creating the component on the web layer. I'm creating the data to get to him. Now, when you say we have separate stories, right. um, are they as two line items in two different projects, but they logically represent the same bit of work? Because that's the typical pattern. It's, right? it's, we're kind of evolving that here with, their, with the Agile. We have a new Scrum Master. Um, so his, his stories, and his, they have two ad Scrum groups. And we've separated the web team from the back end team, mm -hmm. two different Scrums, two different groups. So they create their stories, and then we kind of get together and talk about it. Like, okay, you're creating this web component uh, to list something on your website in React. And I'm like, okay, we well, need this data. All right, I'm going to create this story, kind of a similar title, but maybe I have in there something about the API and the story title. So we kind of work off those two things. Right, but it sounds like it's really – so is it – what makes it different from just being two different views of the same piece of work, right? So there's – it, it, you know, because this is this is yeah. one of the classic um, you know user story uh, problems that goes way back is um, you know uh, splitting stories, splitting features into uh, we we end up splitting every feature into uh, you know one task for the UI part, one task for the database part, one task for the uh, domain layer part, one task for the documentation part, one task for yeah. the testing part. The only difference is, from what I, the only difference is that uh, instead what you have is one task for the UI team's part of the work and one task for the back end team's part of the work. So, yeah, but we separate them into stories though. Like, so I'm a are, big component on small stories. So like, I don't like right, but, a lot of but, but to, to me, I, I, I can't call those stories. And okay. the reason I can't call them stories is because you can't deliver either one without the other. True or false? It's true. Okay, so then to me, I can't use the term story to refer to those. If you can't, re if you can't, uh, if you can't deliver either of those parts independently, then to me they're not stories. Now, if if it turns out that um, you know the the company decides, hey, you know what, are you are the application we're building isn't selling all that well, but customers are telling us that they want to be able to reuse our backend services. And you could imagine the company saying, hey, let's uh, re-envision this project, drop all the UI stuff, and just expose APIs. And now all of a sudden, those become stories because your product is now the API instead of the application. Yeah, so if you expose uh, the API, API then probably... becomes the feature. Well, now, the yeah. only reason I bring this up, it's not that I necessarily care that you use the term story correctly. Yeah. But this is one of the I, – I, there's lots of stuff out there written about how to do stories mm -hmm. that doesn't apply very well to what you're describing using okay. the word story. That's the only reason I care. Okay. Because I'm worried that you're going to read a bunch of stuff about BDD, you're going to try to apply it to this situation, yeah. and because you're thinking of these things as stories, even though they don't really fit the mold of what a story should be, um, then you're going to end up, then it's essentially you're, you know, you're trying to use karate principles to fire a gun. It doesn't work. Yeah, so, so when, you, uh, when you say my situation, you mean, um, again, you mean uh, code-wise or organization-wise? Uh, well, in this case, it's organization-wise because we're talking about, um, the, the, to me, the story is the feature that, y that the back end and UI work together to produce. I don't know if there's other stuff, but at least these two, right? Yeah. So, um, what, in the situation you're describing, what, what usually happens is somebody's responsible for trying to express what we want as stories. Right. I'm not even worried about how well they do that now. Right. Okay. Then, because we've decided that there are two teams, a decision I don't necessarily support. I uh, really had to get it to you, yeah. yeah. Right. So then, the, because we've decided to do that, it's like we split every story into two tasks. Yeah. One task is the UI team's yep. part, and the other task is the back-end team's part. Correct. And then within, the, so now you, your team now has just a bunch of tasks, which is do the back-end part of story one, story two, story three, story four, yep. and then you figure out how to get that work done. Mm -hmm. The reason that I don't call those stories is you can't do things, you can't as easily do things like Negotiate the scope of those things. Negotiate the, like you can't negotiate the scope of your services with customers. Yeah. 
Because if the UI team builds this much of it and you only build that much yeah, of it. Right, you're behind. Right. Yeah, actually, whatever it is, whichever of the two teams builds less yes. determines how big the story is. Determines how much we can actually deliver. Right, they, exactly. They, they can arbitrarily that's decide. Right now. Yes. They can arbitrarily limit what we can build. Correct. And so so that's we, one of the we are that, limiting them by trying to do this BDD when they're not doing BDD and they're trying to build more components, then we're ready to deliver. Well, data. so then, then there's the difference in philosophy, right? So you're, you're so in, yeah. in uh, trying to do BDD in your situation probably to me boils down more to, uh, hey, UI team, let's you and us work together Slice the story, slice the feature down into the smallest, um, useful parts. Mm -hmm. You build your section, we'll build our section, then we'll integrate. Mm -hmm. That's the sense in which you guys can do BDD. Yeah, we are doing that. We're very small. Break it down as small as we can. Work on those. They're related, but work on them. Right, two and, then the big, and then the big problem just becomes coordinating, making sure that yes. you know if they're working on this slice then you should also be working on that slice. Right. If, they, yes. if they expect to deliver these five slices this week, then you need to be yep. com com confident that you're at least working on those five slices and delivering as many as you Correct. can. And especially the then sprint. there's the coordination problems that go along with Correct. it. Correct. And especially the sprint, you, if you're doing something parallel and they're both dependent on each other, that doesn't necessarily work. Right. If you, you need to make sure you're done before so they can hit your API and it's, you know, it can become a, a kind of a, a code and run situation. So, so, so then I could see the two teams together trying to do BDD in order to explore and writing scenarios in order to explore what feature are we trying to deliver to our customers. Yeah. And then you look at that and say, okay, together we have figured out, we've used scenarios to articulate what we're going to try to build. Okay. Now you build your part, I'll build my part. Oh, okay. So and you actually we'll do some, some pre-work to figure out what the requirements kind of. Say that again? You're doing some, some work up front to kind of figure out the requirements of what you actually want to build the future. Well, not so much up front, but okay. more that you can't do BDD on your part of the story any more than they can do BDD on their part of the story. They, they can maybe do it, maybe they can because they are more, uh, they're more uh, user-facing yeah. than you are. Right, right. Um, so, but really, um, the, the problem then becomes if they try to do BDD on the features without you, then they'll make assumptions about what you're capable of doing yep. and how long it'll take and they won't real they'll probably end up being the bottleneck so then they'll, they'll either make promises they can't keep correct or they'll um or they will miss opportunities that you can see mm -hmm. that really if you guys if you guys want to do bdd on this project i think you need to do it at the level of your team and their team working working together as a single group okay. to explore features with Whoever represents the I see the product. Yeah, we're not we're not we're not on the same wavelength as is that. So the web team's not really doing BDD. I'm trying to do BDD for my stuff, and that you're seeing it's probably not going to work. Then. I, yeah. So I would okay. say if you're if you uh, if you want to learn if you want to practice BDD for the sake of practicing BDD, there's a few things you can do. One is do it on a a pet project. Mm -hmm. uh, two is um, or the other thing that you can do is. You can play the role, like you can essentially do what you think BDD would be yeah. on this project right, right, right. as a side thing, but you're probably not going to be able to, the only way that you could actually use any of that um, work on the project itself uh, is either, you know, so you might, for example, stumble across some awesome way of slicing a really big feature. That makes everybody much less nervous about trying to build it. Yo, yeah, definitely. That would be one time. thing that you could do. Now, right. the, 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 another thing that could happen uh -huh. is you could, um, you could uh, use it as a way to sort of review how your team and their team have agreed to split a feature. Exactly. And find that that wasn't a good idea. Yes, that's exactly that what I want to use happen. it for. Just exact reasons right here. Communication okay, good. reasons. Yes. Now, the risk that you take by doing it on your own is you're going to have to make assumptions based on information that the UI team has that you don't. And yes. I don't know how big of a risk that is for you. Yes, you, no. you, might, you might feel like you know 90% of what the UI team is thinking, or you might think 
that you know 10% of what the UI team is thinking. That, I think that depends a lot on how long have you been working together, how well do you know them, how much yeah, it does. have you done we're, we're learning to, we're, Yep, we're learning to communicate back and forth. These are all new guys, too, in California, so... Right, are, so you know, there might be stuff. There might be stuff that you might make. You're going to have to make assumptions about what they're thinking and how they yes. would react and how they would behave. Yes. That might yes. be wrong. You yes. also are going to have to make assumptions about the product that you might or might not have the right information. Maybe the, some, the UI team has some of that information and you don't. Right. It might be that the UI team and you don't have that information, but whoever's playing the role of product champion doesn't is the only one who has that information. Yeah, you're, you're putting the picture that's going on right now. So go. Ahead. Yeah, it's good. So okay, good. So uh, it could even be that even you, you, the UI team, and the product champion have uh, wrong ideas about what's needed, about what the customers are actually looking for, what they need. Mm -hmm. that, that last problem. The good news is that last problem is a problem whether you do BDD on your own or with, together with the UI team. So the good news is that problem, which is actually the worst problem, is the one that provides the it's the least risky for you trying to do BDD on your own. Right. But so I think really what I'm trying to, to come back to is I've seen programmers try to do BDD on their own without business people involvement. Yep. And what almost what almost always happens is um, they they develop some basic skill about how to do BDD. So there's there's some basic skills that the programmers develop that's useful. They learn how to articulate scenarios better. Mm -hmm. They become more sensitive to when technical detail is leaking into their scenario so that they can practice taking it out. Yep. But, unfortunately, what ends up happening is they end up, uh, they end up essentially getting good at test automation but not practicing any of the scope negotiation uh, that, to me, is the real, the real point of BDD. If you're going to, you know, if you try, what you have in mind to do BDD on your own on this project really amounts to getting better at doing test automation. It's a good goal. It's probably helpful. It's probably a skill worth developing. It's probably going to help you on this project. But it's not necessarily going to help you with things like um, what are some of the magic trigger phrases and questions that I can use when I'm talking to predominantly business people that will help us figure out the assumptions they're making that I'm not or I'm making that they're not, which are the dangerous ones. You know, so you know, the only thing going to help me if I have those scenarios. Like, so my goal, like you, that part is what you're talking about, I'm trying to use this, these scenarios for is when I'm talking to the web team, um, in our script planning, whatever, whatnot, we're creating these stories together. I want to get their, their, where are the requirements of the web team to hit our API? I want to get those in scenarios so that we're both on the same page. And right. while it may not hit all the things they need, I, I want to say, hey, look, this is our story. Look at we have these things. Yeah. This is what we're giving you. And that's why I want to use BDD for is it, Yes, I like Gherkin because it, it's very clear. Um, I don't really mm -hmm. take that and do Cucumber. I was going to, but I'm doing mobile right. now. and just copied over. It's much easier. So um, that, communication, yeah. that communication gap, I, I feel like this is where I can really pin that stuff down in stories. But then the question is, am I creating good scenarios? I, first of all, right. I wasn't. They were too technical. Now I'm kind of getting better at that. Well, I'm not sure. So, so now, okay. it, 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 it's, so if, you, if your goal is to clarify the contract between you and the UI, correct? Then I again, I don't want to. I I I I don't. I get nervous when you use the term "do BDD" for that, because that to me is not what doing BDD is. That's design. That's just that's just software design, right? It's exactly the same. It's exactly the same as if you, um, you know, you split some work between two programmers mm -hmm. who are working on different components You're right. and just completely lower level design. Together. It is. Now there's one pro there's one programmer who's working on the client and there's one programmer who's working on the supplier. Let's assume that that's the case, since that matches. Now, one of the design principles that I would use is supplier don't just the supplier doesn't drive the conversation. Or let me no, let me say that differently. That was wrong. The supplier might drive the conversation, but the consumer drives the decisions. In other words, you're in the position in this situation, like I'm in the position with the conversation you and I are having right now. I'm. I'm telling you, um, 
I'm essentially trying to draw details out of you so that I can build up my understanding of how to help you. Correct. Okay. In order to do that, what I'm doing is I'm taking a little bit of information from you. I'm making some guesses about what that means. I'm giving you those guesses. Mm -hmm. And I'm using your reactions to tell me whether I'm on the right track or not, right? And I'm, so I'm being a very good listener, and I want to butt in, but I'm not yet. <laughs> right. So the, 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 um, the, the more that I feel like I'm on the right track, okay. then the, that validates my picture of what's happening, and then I can use that to help figure out what I should be doing, what I should well. be suggesting to you. Yeah, it works well. And, I, and, and to me, this isn't... Um, so the style of conversation, even if we did this with soft, with the, you know, with the, the contract between the piece of software you're trying to write and the part that you want me to write, this isn't doing BDD as far as I'm concerned. This is doing software design. This is me as the supplier asking you a bunch of questions about what you think you need, um, simultaneously doing two things. Uh, trying, trying to get, get at the essence, essence of what you need so that we can minimize how much we build. Right. And making a bunch of guesses uh, or uh, um, articulating to you the picture that's forming in my mind so that you can poke holes in it. My goal is that you're going to tell me where I've got, where I've got it wrong okay. and then I'm going to, when I've got something wrong, try to drive towards the smallest thing that could possibly be right. Okay. To me, that's just software design. Okay, yes. And it feels like that's what, it yeah. sounds like that's what you want to do. Yes, it is. With, this, with, these, with these folks. It is. That you're, 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 you're essentially, so the, the sense in which you're doing BDD, the part of BDD that you're doing is you're negotiating scope by constantly saying, here's what, I, here's this, okay, based on what you've told me so far, here is the simplest thing I could think of that we could possibly build. Would that be enough? Correct. Exactly. So to me, that's the part of BDD that you're doing. Yes, it is. That's what I want to do. Yes. Uh, and to me, that is that's software design. Okay. That's an aspect of BDD. Okay. Um, and again, the the so where where Gherkin I think helps is um, using Gherkin to write down. What you think you so every time you write down a Gherkin scenario, it's like you're drafting an agreement. It's like you're saying, yeah. based on the conversation we've had in the last twenty minutes, here's what I think we're agreeing to. This is what you're delivering. And then saying, what am I missing? You know, is there anything big missing here? Exactly. Yes. We started here. Would that be okay? And oh, and by the way, it would be cool if we could scratch that out and that yes, out. Yes, that's exactly that what I was jerking for. Exactly. Okay, now I'm perfect. With you. That's exactly that's what I'm trying to drive to because it it removes yes. chaos, and it, it it also gives us a scope to work with and an agreement to work with. That's the smallest possible thing we can build. That totally is what I want to do. So where I think where I think that Gherkin would be the most helpful then would be in. Trying to articulate along with the UI team, what scenarios are we building for the customers? And yeah. then to take those scenarios and say, okay, uh, we know that we we know that together we want to make this thing pass. Mm -hmm. Now, based on the structure of the teams, what that probably means is, um, in a way, this becomes. If you automated this as a test, you would automate it through the UI, and then it would pass when the UI and the back end have integrated together correctly. Oh, okay. And that, that would be your way of that would be your way of knowing UI team plus back end team together actually have a working scenario that's a step towards finishing that feature. And this is it the proper way to do? B I mean, you, so I don't well, really so care about ulti integration ulti tests. Ultimately, yes. I mean, in so much as there is a proper way. Right. Ultimately, yes. But so, so for me, I don't care about that top portion uh, for integration testing. I just care about my right scope. So then, when you have so where I could see if I'm working on your team, what I would expect to happen is we would look at that scenario and then say, okay. We need to make some assumptions about what part of this the UI team is going to do and what part of this we're going to do. Um, and there's a bunch of, you know, 
there's a there's a fairly clear line that you know is like 85 percent obvious 85 percent of of our part and their part is going to be clear yeah yeah and the last 15 percent might be a bit fuzzy because for example uh by building it in a certain way, we're going to create some code paths that we can't avoid because of the tools or the language we're working in, where the UI has to do some corresponding stuff, even though really in those code paths, they kind of actually want to do nothing. Like we might need to throw some exceptions because of a framework we're using, and we just need the UI to catch those exceptions. We might need the UI to just say, well, we're going to let those uh, uh, exceptions bubble up up to a you know one of those we're sorry our website's having trouble yeah, right yeah. Now. that's their responsibility is to deal with that kind of stuff not our agency. Well, right so uh, one of the risks is that things like that will fall through the cracks because of the way we've divided things up okay and that is the only thing that would make me care about putting the two things together to run an end-to-end scenario right now as we do more and more of these similar kinds of features over time You'll learn the kinds of things that the UI team tends to do, the, 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 the kinds of decisions the UI team tends to make that affects your, your design. Okay. The UI team will learn the kinds of decisions that you tend to make that affects their part of the design. They'll, they'll, you know, then you'll start having conversations like, hey, let's look at this story. Now, somebody on the UI team will say, well, I assume because you're going to be using blah, blah, blah framework, which is going to force you to do blah, 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 stupid thing. We're going to have to do blah, 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 stupid thing to compensate, right? Are we going to have to do that again this time? And, and you'll say, say yeah, yeah, unfortunately, we will. Okay, okay cool. cool. That part's really clear. Okay. But, but then, then we're back to um, what do we use to express the contract between their code and our code? Yes. Yeah. And I'm still not convinced that Gherkin is yeah. a good yeah. language to do that in. It hasn't been easy to figure that out for that. that I, for this, I, this I would yes. just. So, so what, what is the act? So, I guess the. The integration mechanism between them and you is, is it really just plain HTTP? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then to me, HTTP is the language. That's the that delivery discussing. mechanism that we're using, yes. And, right. and I try to keep that out of my story. So let me back up for a second. What you, what you saw in the beginning is not what I'm starting to do now. Like I first gave you those right. scenarios. Yeah. I realized this doesn't seem right, like you're saying. Um, so what I'm doing, if I could show you an example, I'd like to. I uh, have right here on my screen. I don't know if I can. Sure, go ahead, share it. Right. Um, and uh, I guess this idea from the Clean Code Forum, which it, it was interesting. I want to see you think about it. So can you see my screen? Uh, I do now, yeah. yeah. All right, so let me open this up here. Hold on. Now... This is the old stuff I used to do, and I think it's too specific. It doesn't really talk about business needs at a high level. Now, this is different. This is taking a different approach, um, and you're, you're doing inputs yeah. and outputs, and it's very general. There's no domain stuff in here, you know, no uh, delivery mechanism in here. Right. Yeah. Um, this is if, – if we were writing – if we were uh, building the story, uh, doing the whole of the story to get – you know – if we were responsible for doing all parts of the story from beginning to end, I would expect to write stuff like that. Correct. And I'm getting used to – and that was a good example this guy gave me. And it just really got me thinking. So what happened is – so I'm like, okay, I think, I, I think I've got a better gist of how to write these things for this API. And to, to use that as an interface to talk to, with the web team to get the requirements. Right. And so this is, this is what I would use to – so yeah, the UI and the backend teams working together to articulate their common understanding of what a feature is supposed to be for the customer. I would expect to use this format. Yes, and I'm using that's that how we want to do it. And I'm using it at my at my layer, which is the contract level. Right, and I and I would not do that. Oh, I would. I in fact, if you go back up to what you were doing before in the the so so, so yes and no. So. You, you are going to want to write, you're eventually going to want to write tests at this level of detail because the contract between you and the UI team is really going to boil down to what, is the, what are the names of the, you know, of the RESTful resources, what's the URI scheme, when do we need to use HTTPS and when don't we, 
Um, you know, what are the parameter names if we have them? Yep. If there's any weirdness in path info, those are all parts of the contract between you and the UI team right. because ultimately what you and the UI team are doing together is designing the solution for that feature. Right, and our, our feature is the contract to them. So, no, no, no be, be careful. careful. I guess it depends on the, the, it depends on which hour you mean. So, the, the, to me, the feature is what you and the UI team together work on and deliver to a customer. Okay. What you're developing is a part of the solution that implements that feature. Okay. But you're not implementing features as far as I can tell. Oh, so you're reviewing a more top-level feature. There's no sub-layer feature. I wouldn't call that a feature unless you're also treating your API as a standalone product. If you're treating your API as a standalone product, yeah. Then the, the dynamic, dynamic changes, changes completely because, because now the UI team is just one of your customers. And that's what's and happening. Yeah. So this, this API is going to be used not just by the API team but other apps. And we might expose it publicly in the future. That's okay. What we say, at least. But. So, so then, then at that, that point, point, okay. Now now that, that, that makes, makes certainly that makes a big difference. difference. It is standalone now, for sure. It's a reuse, are, reusable right. search data API basically that we can hopefully reuse and keep generic enough to reuse. Across okay. all our apps. So, so that, that, that when you start having customers who aren't this UI team. Yes, it's a concern of mine. Then that's the point at which, um, well, see, still it seems to me that what, you're, what you end up with at that point is you're building a toolkit, not an application. And again, um, yeah. Building a toolkit is fundamentally different from building an application. You can't, you know, building a toolkit, like building a framework, the, the, the design, um, what's the term I'm thinking of? The, the sort of the design um, ethic is completeness and minimalism. Whereas, uh, in other words, your, your completeness is important in an API or a toolkit. In other words, if you expose, you, you have to be able to round out anything that you build um, based on any way that anyone might ever choose to use it. Yeah, as far as you can right. which we aren't thinking about right now, and I'm trying to get people to say, hey, you know, we need to think about this in our architecture too. It's always well, so, in the back of your mind. Um, right, because when, when you're doing, doing when you're, one of the, the, the shortcuts that makes BDD work is being able to um, is being able to take advantage of the fact that you are building a feature for a specific customer or you're building software for a specific feature and being able to make all kinds of simplifying decisions and being able to build incomplete things as long as they work that's really what makes BDD that ma that's what makes BDD eff uh, uh, effective and what makes BDD more than just incrementally pumping out features is the idea that I can take advantage of my close relationship with the customer to we can agree to to build something that's incomplete but oh, it still works and, and in my case I can't build something incomplete it has to work right <laughs> right so that's to me why I would you the, the so that the aspect of BDD that you would focus on the BDD philosophy part that you focus on is minimalism is trying to build the you know in your case trying to build whatever you build with say the fewest restful resources possible right, right. and so and that guys don't take on a new resource unless people are absolutely damn sure yep. that you absolutely need it now mm -hmm. and whatever resources you expose yep you need to make sure because you're building a toolkit if you're going to build it so that people can use it in other situations then you can't just build, you can't just make the UI team scenarios pass, but you have to then think about, if I expose this aspect of a resource, what are all the ways it can possibly be used? Yes. And yep. So that, that's the sense in which you'd be exploring right. And you don't want to have an API that's coupled to their use cases. You want, and what if you're returning right. something, an ID they want, but the rest of the world doesn't give a crap about? Right. Exactly. Their, their, their features... Their stories become inspiration for you, but um, they're not the project plan. What they are is they, that, that's maybe where you would draw ideas for 
what part of the API for what part of the API to build next, or for some feature of the API that isn't just the basic resources, or for a relationship between resources that you didn't think of, or especially in the case of REST, for um, uh, discovering a relationship resource that you wouldn't have thought of before. Yeah, when and you were that's thinking of more domain logic own. stuff. So I decided I wanted to abstract that kind of stuff out into its own API, basically. You know, when you start getting that deep into stuff where you have relationships and rules, I want I don't want that to be muddying my simple search rest. Right. Area. You want to do you, you want to do, do the, the bare minimum, minimum of that you correct. can absolutely get away with, correct. with correct. and maybe zero. zero. Yep. Um, yep. And so I, if if you're going to think of your the REST API as being its own product, yes, I do. Then you might use some a small group of Gherkin scenarios. Uh, sorry, a small group of scenarios, possibly written in Gherkin, as a way to help ground your design choices. As, As a way of sort of doing a sanity check, check that you're not just building stuff for the hell of it. Yeah. Yep. But, but that your the stuff that you're building, that you at least understand one business use of the stuff that you're building. Yes. It's a way of sort of it, 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 you know, it's not it's not doing BDD, but more using scenarios as a way to make sure that you haven't just run off onto your own little island. You've hit it the nail on the head. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Okay. That's the part of BDD I'm trying to use. So, so then, my advantage. So, so then, when it, so, so here's what I would say: when it comes to clarifying the contract between the UI team and you guys, between the UI, I'm gonna stop saying the teams now. When it comes time to clarify the contract between the UI and your backend services, mm -hmm. there's no BDD there as far as I can tell. That's just test automation and software design. It's the, you're doing tests. You're using tests. To, to clarify your understanding of the contract, to check that the picture in their head of the part that they need to do matches the part, the picture in your head of what they need to do. Yes. To to show them here's what we intend to do, so you don't have to do these parts, and when we put them together, they'll just work. There's no BDD here yet. The BDD part comes in. The 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 part of BDD that is going to help you is in. Um, Every so often, you're going to want to look, especially when it comes time to say, work on a new resource. So somebody says, you know, I think now is a good time for us to add a new resource. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to start figuring the details out of how to do that until I've seen a handful of scenarios that demonstrate the business case for needing that new resource. Okay. Once I've seen that those scenarios now. You are, are not, not going to write those scenarios, scenarios on your own. The PM usually writes those, right? I mean, what I hope is there would be, be, be something. You know, the, 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 somebody, somebody, somebody who has vision of the whole product. product. Yeah, we have a PM that does that, right? right. He's, he's so, got his own scenarios or his own stories. He doesn't really, do, you know, Gherkin formula is fine, but he gives right. us those so, top level so, requirements. So, yep. Right. And what, what you so, so then the the act, act of writing those scenarios of everyone at least reading those scenarios is again it's okay. I think I understand the business problem they're trying to solve. Yep. I've seen a few examples of the business problem they're trying to solve. Yeah, we've done that. Here's the restful components I have in mind that I think is going to support that. Yes. And once you then start figuring out the details of how to build that restful component, BDD is out of the picture. Now you are using uh, you're using TDD in two basic ways. One, the one is uh, figuring out the contracts between the UI and you. So let's assume for a moment that we're talking about a feature that the UI team has to do some work to deliver that feature, okay. as opposed to someone. Or since you're just in the business, I, I'm going to assume for a moment that there is a non API components to the solution, right? There, if, if at some point, like there's two cases, there's, 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 there's going to be some features that someone's going to come up with and say, all we need to do is build the back end API, we'll ship that, and yeah. then our customers will build their own applications on top. Correct. I'm talking about the other case for now where those applications still are in house. So to figure out the contract between you and the UI, 
you're, you're using, using tests uh, to clarify the contract, contract mm -hmm. between the UI and the back end so, so that you know the, the that's, that's just work breakdown break structure stuff. stuff. That's okay. I know which part we have to build. I know which part we're expecting them to build. We're pretty clear on you're doing this part, we're doing that part, and then when we put them together, there's a very good chance that there will be no holes. And that, the other, are those the feature yeah. tests you're talking about, or are those the lower level TDD tests? That's so that you're, this is all TDD now. Okay. So you're you're gonna, you can use contract tests to express essentially. Um, okay. How you're breaking down the work between the UI and the back end. Based on the, that scenarios you wrote, a couple that you wrote in maybe in our Right, so, okay. so um, in a way, I would say it's the UI team's responsibility ultimately. But you will work together. You can look at the Gherkin scenario, the BDD Gherkin scenarios, as a way of, of sort of making sure that you're not missing anything big, that you're not. You know, that you haven't made a contract decision that, say, contradicts something in that Correct. scenario. Yeah, right. And that what you've got in your contract at least covers those scenarios yep. and then pro probably provides some extra. Oh, maybe it's interesting. Okay. Maybe it extra. matches I perfectly. About that one. Yeah, yeah. But it's not, but it's not, it's not meant to be a transcription of those scenarios. Okay. It's more like I can see how what we're building covers those scenarios. Okay, this is the other to a, a main question I have, actually. Correct. You actually led right into. Um, a debate, uh, my colleague, that we're you know do we're trying to get him doing BD or TD whatever. We uh, I created some. So if I go back to if I share my screen, I want it's exactly yeah. what I want to show you is. Uh, is I can give you a concrete example of what we're debating about, which is what happened to my uh, browser here. Um, okay. Which is going back to the new way I was trying to define yeah. those, and his big thing was this scenario. He's like, "Why do you? That would be a lower level, lower level sorry, lower level test, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be?" I'm like, "No, right. it's so, still yeah. a requirement I, because how do you know what what as a business requirement? If it's not found, how how do you know what the behavior should be when it comes back? You can assume right. that so the user might think, oh, it's going to be null, but.'" Do the, should we send a message? Should we not send a message? Exactly. Back? So the style of test matches what I would expect you to do for your scenarios, but the scope of the test doesn't. Okay. The scope of the test, that looks like... Now, Jim Shore has talked about customer unit tests, right? That there are some, there are some business rules that are of, of importance to a non-technical stakeholder. Yes. Which he, but, he argues is this one right here. Right. Which is but the path. Yeah. that... We can, we can implement those rules with, say, a single module. And yeah, we're going to plug that module into an application to make that module actually do something in the application. But ultimately, there are some parts of the system that, either because they're very detailed or because they're very simple, the you know things like you know calculating tax and shipping costs or calculating. Um, Calculating um, approval decision, you know, implementing approval decision trees, things like that. Mm -hmm. These are things that the customer cares about, the, the, the non-technical person cares about. But I don't have to run an end-to-end -end test to show that I've implemented that stuff correctly. I could use their business rules and implement them directly in a C sharp object, let's say. Mm -hmm. And so what I might do is I might take their tests and instead of running uh, take, take their scenarios and instead of plugging them into the application and running the entire application end to end to check my implementation of their policies i might just connect them directly and so that's a case where you have tests that look like this the scope is the scope looks small but the business significance of the tests is obvious in these tests so the scope of these tests is okay but the business significance is totally not there. Like, I don't see any, like, why the hell do I care about whether there are a list of countries? I, my immediate reaction when I look at these scenarios is, why do we care about the list of countries? What's the good business reason to do that? Um, for me, for me so, it's the out, inputs, outputs, um, which are the requirements of the API. Like, they expect to get an output of a list of something from our contract. 
which to me right. is and to me that sounds like to, to, to me, me that sounds like a, a, again, again if we're if we're doing if this is an API that we're shipping as part of a toolkit that people are going to use to build their own applications cool but if our goal is to support a particular application or a small number of applications that are all in house for example then uh, to me I would just write these tests Directly in a programming in a programming language in a testing library and okay. Low, now, these would be you can lower still test to you. Uh, so these would be lower level tests to you, basically. Yeah, yeah th these, these seem like uh, this seems like an ob this seems like an object level implementation okay. detail kind of test. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the debate we're having right now. Is um, I felt like we should have. When I, actually, I, when I watched one of your videos, I, I was a BDD to first BDD to TDD. I yeah. thought you did something like this, where I think Uncle Bob mentioned it as in uh, other people, whoever came up with this primary course use case and extension courses of the use case. So what I thought was this is yes. a primary course. This is a happy path. We're getting no problems. We get what we want back, which is a list of countries. But I said, yeah. but I said, what about the other situations? The I guess they're called extension courses. Where you get nothing back. It's not an error, but you get nothing back. Oh, what, what do you want to do with the, that? The, 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 um, so, assuming, assuming that this was the scope of test that you wanted to write, write absolutely. The, 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 I mean, those tests are the bare minimum of what I would expect. I would expect, is, you know, since we're talking about countries, a list of countries with some filters, then I would expect. Zero, one, many, at least, okay. as your three, as your three tests. Mm -hmm. No, I, I have no quarrel at all with the number of tests. Okay. I have no quarrel at all with the tests look pretty complete, but it seems to me that they're not, they're not scenarios unless, unless providing a list of countries is your product. You get what I mean? That's how I view it as. I view our API as a product. And so that, who, to me, these who are, are the who are, who are the customers other than this, other than this UI team? The, the callers of our API. Who, and, and who are they? Right now, it's just the web team. Right now, it's the web team. It could be other people later. Okay, okay so, so if you, you want, want to treat your product as a product, that's fine, fine but then you need, you, like, like I said, this goes back to what I said earlier. There's a fundamental difference between building an application and building a toolkit or framework. And when you're building a toolkit or framework, you can't, the, the, the kinds of BDD style scope negotiation that you can do in an application is not the kind of stuff that you can do in a framework. Huh. When you're building a framework or a library, your focus is not on doing the minimum thing to make one customer happy. It's on doing, it's on making sure that whatever you do is complete enough so that any customer who might ever pick it up won't be surprised by it. That's, That's a, a fundamental, fundamental difference in the way you approach the product. And the kind of stuff, when, when you read about BDD, when you read stuff from Dan North, Liz Keo, Chris Matz, yeah. uh, the A-Flight guys, uh -huh. whoever, uh -huh. the style of BDD that they're talking about, 99% of it has to do with um, essentially... Custom application discovery okay. is not oh, how to design framework. framework. It's not okay. how to design a toolkit. Hmm. And that, that, to me, that, that, big, that big difference is, I think, the source of a lot of your confusion. It is. It is. Because you're reading a bunch of stuff yeah. that sounds like good advice until you try to use it in your situation. Yeah, my situation is different. Go. Yeah, it, it, you never see videos out there or you know, articles talking about how to or if to use BDD for my situation. They talk about right. the, the application. And, 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 and I'll be, I'll be frank. I've never been able to put my finger on this difference before. You've made this clear to me it's hard. in this conversation yeah. that um, you know, a lot of what we talk about as the point of BDD, mm -hmm. and I'm very much like, I, I'm very much, uh, you know, um, I, I, I'm definitely in the, uh, a lot in, um, what's the phrase I'm looking for? My style here is a lot like the style of people like Liz Keough, like Jeff Patton. Mm -hmm. um, our goal is to avoid. Our goal is to avoid running away, building a bunch of software, 
and hoping that some subset of it solves their problem. That's the typical way that a lot of people build applications. And what they end up doing is they end up building, that's how you end up with the, you know, the chaos report findings, 64% of features are hardly or never used. I know that's the bullshit study, but go with it. I mean, the, the idea behind that study is true. We do find out when we build an application for a specific client or for maybe a handful of clients, what almost always ends up happening is we build, we look back and we think, oh, if we had only had a crystal ball, we would have built this 20% of it. That would have delivered 90% of the revenue and that would be much better. When you're, when you're shipping a framework or a toolkit, you're literally doing the exact opposite of that. You're, in fact, you're trying to do the thing that when you build an application, you don't want to do. When you build an application, you're trying to figure out how to build the smallest amount of everything, the smallest vertical slice of everything that will satisfy that customer. And then you're hoping that that satisfaction will fund you fleshing that out. Yes. When you're building a team, when you're building a toolkit or a framework, you're actually doing the exact opposite. What you want to do is figure out the smallest possible domain to build but build as much of it as you can possibly reasonably think of to build because you literally don't know who's going to use it and how they're going to try to use it. So you have to make sure that whatever you build is consistent, uh, doesn't have any obvious missing parts. Like completeness becomes much more important than fitness for a particular so architecture becomes more important. It's more weight on oh, reuse and, and or, I mean, no. like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, how, maybe I said it wrong. Um, keeping it generic, keeping it, you should focus on keeping it reusable. Uh, right. You want, right. you want, you want, you, you want the exact opposite of an application. Yeah, yeah, application so. should be custom built, yep. custom fit. Right. The exact features they need for the exact business problems that you know they need to solve right now. Yep. That's what Agile in general tries to do. I see. Agile says, assume for a moment, like, like, Agile is the custom tailor. It's the custom, it's getting your suit made by a tailor. That's Agile. When you're, you know, what you're trying to do is you're trying to build off the rack. You're trying to build, you know, you're, you're trying to do, uh, you know, uh, hundred dollar suit shop. Okay. Yeah. And so your best bet is, you know, we have three lines of suits. Uh, they appeal to 85% of the population, the men out there who don't want to spend a thousand bucks on a suit. Yeah. There's a very good chance that one of that, uh, you know, uh, almost everyone who walks into this shop is going to find something they like. Nothing. I was obvious trying to do both. I was trying to, uh, Play both roles. Good luck yeah. with that. <laughs> yeah, so that's right. why my scenarios were so hard to think about. You know exactly. So, so, the, so, so thinking in terms of scenarios works best when we are exploring. Uh, when we're trying to build part of an application, we're exploring what we're trying to build, and our goal is always to try to drive to pull. Context about the business out from the business people and trying to figure out the smallest thing we could possibly build that will do that for them. When you're building a framework or a toolkit, you're still trying to build the smallest thing that could help them. But you can't do this other thing that you're trying to do, you can't do. They're not there. You have to imagine every possible way people are going to use this and make sure all of that works. All right, so, so if, I, if I were to think of this this way, if we get to a point where we start doing more business logic domain stuff for the API, we would abstract that out into its own stories, its own layer. Maybe that's where I can do the BDD. For my stuff now, where I'm going to be reusing this possibly inside and outside the company, I shouldn't be doing, try to be doing BDD with this kind of stuff, this scenario kind of stuff. I, I think, I think where, the B, where BDD helps is in grounding your design choices being able to see the business reason that justifies some of your design choices. Yes, correct. I, I see but, that. For example, as soon as you decide that you're going to expose customer as a rest resource, it's got to be a complete, consistent, 
resource. resource. In other words, you can't say, well, we don't have to worry about delete customer because that's never going to happen. Oh, yeah. I, I, I or, this you can, yeah. Actually, it, but, let, me, let me actually say that even better. Yeah. When, when we're working in an application, application we can say, we know we need to eventually do delete customer, customer mm -hmm. but we can do that like in four months. Yeah. And in the very worst case for now, just use SQL. You can't do that. If you're going to think of your API as a standalone product, oh, yeah, then right. You do not want to. You do not want delete customer to end up with not supported yet. You want that. If you're going to publish customer as a resource, yep. then get post I have these conversations a lot. Yeah, you're, 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 that's the difference. You've probably seen this a lot too. Where when you're building something that's going to be reusable and possibly external, you have to think about that now. And then when I get this developer saying it'll never happen, you can't think that way. If you build it in a way it never happen, you're going to fail. Yes, and yes, so, yes, but yes, I can't yes, get yes. that through to people, and it's it's it's. I try to be tactful with it, and it's just like, how do you? <laughs> you can get away. You can get away with thinking that'll never happen, right? It doesn't. If you know the application that's going to use your service, and if you build your service just for that application, then you can actually say, yeah, you know what? Um, you can take that risk. I, I, you're, it'll never happen is wrong, but we can get away without that for a year. It's a risk. Okay. Well, if you're going to put, if you're going to put your API up somewhere for people to use. Yeah, you can't do that, right. And then they find out that they can't do delete customer, and that's the one thing they care about doing right now, you've lost a customer for life. Yep. Okay. So that to me is the big difference. So where, uh, where BD I think is going to be helpful for you is not... Not in automating scenario, writing in automating scenarios, but in more talking in examples in order to challenge someone's claim that such and such resource is going to be important, right? You're sitting in a meeting, somebody says, well, I guess that means that we're going to need a blah, blah, blah resource. Now, you've never, we haven't had to build blah, blah, blah resource. You know that as soon as we start building some part of blah, blah, blah resource, we're going to have to build all of it because we're going to publish it. So, so then, then you say, OK, okay um, cool that you think we need blah, blah, blah resource. Let me ask you some questions to make sure that we absolutely can't do it another way with the pieces that we already have available. Because if I build this part of blah, blah, blah resource for you, that's OK. But then we can never publish that as part of our publishable as part of our published API until we build the rest of it, until we build all of get, post, put, head, delete until we make sure that it works, that the whole thing works perfectly. So then you can use, so you can use talking in examples, which to me is the heart of BDD. Right. You can use talking in examples to explore with the AUI team, with the PM, with whoever. Okay, why do you think you need this new resource? Why, do you, why are you so sure that there's no combination of existing resources that could do the job? Um, you know, what, uh, what is it that you're trying to achieve? Is there any way that we can reconfigure what we already have to achieve that or to achieve 80% of it, blah, blah, blah? Your goal there is to, you can use that as a technique to push back on the assumption, to challenge the claim that we need that new resource. Because you know that as soon as you sign up to build that new resource, you have two choices. One is, we don't actually, we build just enough of that resource to satisfy this one application for now, and we yell really loudly at everyone else to make sure they understand this is not ready for publication. Oh, this is what I've been doing, man. Every sprint, I'm like, this is not ready. This is, you know, we have a not solid or, either, you know. Or you say, okay, we can do that, but I'm letting you know that we're going to have to do this much to make your UI happy, then we're going to have to do this much to get that resource to the point where it can be added to the published API. And if we're doing that, that means that we're not working on that next new thing. Now, here's where things might actually work in your favor. Mm -hmm. There are going to be some cases where the UI is going to have to do more work than you. And if that's true, you know, if they have to do three weeks of work worth of work and your piece is only a week, right. that's two weeks where you can get a jump start on that stuff that you need to make the that new resource part of your publishable API. 
and maybe you can get it done and maybe you can't. Right. We give you think, we think about that. But, but then, then there might be some situations where the UI is really simple and the back end is, yeah. for some reason, complex. Maybe you're you're integrating some new third-party service you've never dealt with well, before. Well, happens a lot. You know, or you're integrating some legacy API that sucks ass. Yes. Mm -hmm. In which case you then say, look, guys, I'm just letting you know. We're the bottleneck. We're going to cut to the bone. This is not going to be part of the published API. I don't care how much you beg. I'm not, I'm not signing off on that. Because, because we, we still have to do this much to get to the point where get, put, put post, head, delete, delete all work. So, the, obviously, the, the, there's no question answer to this one, but how do you tell the business that? I mean, you're oh, sprinting, how do you try to tell them that. You're just like, what are you nuts? Like, what are you talking about? Like, we got to get this done. You know, it's chaotic. You know, it's not an agile corporation yet. Here's, here's, what, I, here's, what, I, here's, here's what I, here's what I, here's what we know we can do. Here's what we know we can't do. Here's what we think we might be able to do. And one of my favorite, Stupid, stupid little tricks. tricks. If, if somebody, somebody starts, starts to, you know, you know eventually, eventually you'll end up in a situation where you'll say, we're, we're not going to be able to do X. X. Yeah. You're going to say, but, but I need you to do X. X. Usually, Usually what's understood, understood is I need you to do X by Friday, by, Friday, yeah. by July, July, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you say, uh, that's not going to happen. Right. You hope that they understand that you're not sandbagging and that the conversation ends there. The next level of the conversation is, uh, I really need you to do X by Y, and you eventually just look at them and say, I don't know how to do X by Y. Now, the, the trick there is, I don't know how to do X is much harder to argue with than no X is not going to happen. Right. Because... Uh, I, might, I, might I might still have it in my head, head that uh, you know how to do it, but you're holding out on it. That's, a, that's awesome. Say, I don't yeah. know how to do it. Then, then, they, then it's harder for them. Now, well, plus it, plus it covers more conversation, which might be a good thing for both parties. Right. Now it's, okay, what do you know how to do? Why don't you know how to do this? Right. Is there anything oh, I can yeah. do Is there any way you could learn how to do it in time? Blah, blah, blah. That's awesome. Now, those could be good now. The, that, 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 so that's, that's like the, the that's, that's the first, first level. level. Now, the, the nuclear, nuclear option, the, the you, you know, know the, the conversation, conversation stopper, stopper yeah. is so, so invariably you'll end up in so, so, so I hope the, the other person understands, understands how reasonable you're being and stops, stops the conversation. But sometimes, sometimes they'll push because they're, they're desperate, desperate. Mm -hmm. and they'll say, you know, they'll say things like, "Well, you should know how to do that." You just keep. Oh, you or, just keep only saying, I really, I honestly wish I knew how to do it, and I'm telling you I don't, and I'm sorry about that. You know what's funny? I think our, I think our new DBA does this technique. Now that I realize it, uh, he seems to get out of these conversations, and I don't even realize how he does it until you told me. Right. right. That, it, it, so there's a little bit more, right? So the next, the next level is for them to say things like... Um, you're, you're supposed, supposed to know, know you know, they say things like, you, I, you know, you're supposed to know how to do this, and you can just keep saying, look, I'm sorry, I don't. If they get angry, then you can say, then you can say, look, I'm sorry that I don't know how to do this. I really wish I knew how to do this because I want to help you, but I can't. I promise you if I knew how to do this, I would. I'm even happy to work with you to replace myself with someone who knows how to do this, but if I knew how to do that, we, we would be doing now. that already. <laughs> yeah, <right>. Finally, <laughs> now even, even at, at that point, if there are some people who don't even get like, like at that, that at that point, a reasonable person will say yeah, to themselves, right. exactly. "This guy's on my side. There's, there's nothing more I can do for it." Yeah. But there's still going to be one unreasonable person somewhere who's going to insist, and this is where you bring out the nuclear option, okay. and you just look at them and you say, "Okay, I need you to speak Estonian by Thursday." And, and just have them, and have them, like, the, 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 using this particular, t and, oh, by the way, make sure that you know that they don't speak Estonian or Finnish. Right, yeah. But, so pick another language, but like, you know, I need you to speak Hindi by Thursday. And, and just have them kind of go, I, what are you talking about? And you say, look, I desperately, hey, I desperately need you to speak Hindi by Thursday. And get them to say, and get them to say, but I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't speak. speak. Look, you don't understand. If you don't speak Hindi by Thursday, it's going to cost me like $13.2 million. I've made promises to people who are going to break my legs. If you can't speak Hindi by Thursday, man, you're going to be responsible for killing me. 
If, if you, you can't, can't speak Hindi by Thursday, Thursday, so what happens if you laugh and, and stop to talking? Get them to say nothing, nothing you say or do, nothing you threaten me with, no, no amount of crying, no, no amount of anything is going to make me speak Hindi by Thursday. Yeah. Right. right. And, and no, no amount of crying, crying threatening, <laughs> yelling yeah. is going to make me know how to deliver this thing by next Thursday. Thursday. <laughs> I'm awesome. sorry. Yeah, I like it. Did you write a blog post about that? I think I read something. That I you don't wrote. know if I ever wrote that down. I might have had one. I've used it in a bunch of places, but I've never really. I could swear you had something. Maybe not, but maybe. So there's a, you know, there's a point at which you just kind of have to say, no. I used to say, but the way I do is abrasive. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. And it was actually it was Dale Emery. It was Dale Emery who taught me. The, the power, power of, of I don't know how to do that. that. Because that's, that's, that, that turns, turns the conversation, conversation from we're, we're enemies, enemies yeah. to we're, we're on, on the same, same side and we're both screwed. screwed. Okay, that's cool. I like right. that. To me, that's, that's a huge, that, that, that on its own should, like, like, should work for 95% of people. Right, should, yeah. Most, Most reasonable people say, look, this dude's on my side, we're screwed together. It's not, it's not, you're screwed, buddy. It's, I don't, I don't know how to do this. this. We're screwed together. And that's one of them. And the other one is, well, you know, this, and this is what I've heard a million times the last month or so. Well, you're going to build that. Isn't this, you can just reuse it and add it down, you know, to this and that. You know, you can reuse the same thing real quick and, you know, it's a simple thing for the next thing. They don't understand it. No, it's not always right. reusable or simple. And how do you well, The answer to that is maybe. <laughs> we, can, we, can, we can take that if you want. you want. Maybe. And that, again, the difficult thing about you building a, an API, which is eventually going to be a published API, yeah. is that you do actually, it then becomes your job to do that. It then becomes your job to, but that's a, that's a different design style entirely now. You are, now you are, you have to focus your energy. Like if I, if I, based on this conversation, the one thing that I'm going to suggest to you that you need to learn about uh, is context independent design. That, that is, to me, going to be the most important thing. thing. Have you ever have you read Growing Object Oriented Software Guided by Tests? Oh, uh, I think I started, but I didn't really get into it. No, that that, that goes to the top, top of your list. Is context? What you say? Context? What? You say? Context independent design. Okay. So the, here, let me give you the basic. Uh, give me the, the basic basis. So, um, the, why why does everybody say reuse? Why does everybody say that reusability doesn't work? They say reusability doesn't work because people don't tend to build software to be reusable. Mm -hmm. How do you build stuff to be reusable? Well, reusable means can be used by many different people in many different situations. Well, situation and context mean the same thing in this case. So, how do you build stuff that can be used in... How do you increase the likelihood that code can be used in a different context? Well. The less it knows about its current context, the more likely it could be used in other contexts. So that's just like that's just literally the words. That's just what the definition of those words. There's nothing. It's one of those really simple aha moments, right? So, for example, uh, you know, if I know where my if I know where my input's coming from, that's part of my context. Part of my context is where my input's coming from. If, if I, I know, know where my input's coming from, from, then in order to use me in a different situation, you have to design the way that you provide the input in the same way as the way I get my input now. Because I have something in my code that makes an assumption about where my input's coming from. Why? Why not just say, uh, my input comes from a function parameter, and I don't care where that data comes from. It just If you want to use me, you have to pass me data into that function parameter. In through a constructor parameter, in through a module parameter, whatever. That's that's making me less aware of my context. Right. The, the simplest way to make me less dependent on my context is instead of me knowing where my dependencies come from, I simply say, "Here's what I need to do my job. I don't care where it comes from." So is that like just injection, right? Pretty much. So dependency injection. Okay. One of the goals of dependency injection is. Context independent. Oh, yeah, I've used that a lot, so yeah. It's reducing mm -hmm. the number of things that the code knows about its environment. Yeah, I get that part of it totally. It increases the number of environments in which you can run. Yep. When you're building a toolkit or a framework, that becomes the, fun the fundamental 
if, if you want, want to call it architecture, the fundamental architecture principle becomes context independent. Is that, is that, Again, resort, does that lead you to plug-in architecture then in that case? Right, so you probably end up with a very pluggable architecture. Uh, you probably end up, and the pluggable part of it, you probably end up with um, uh, 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 dependencies on extremely abstract concepts. Mm -hmm. You probably end, uh, and that's again another way that you make things more reusable is uh, to minimize the number of details they depend on. Mm -hmm. So again, that's that's another way of saying context independence. Yeah. That's okay. another way. Of, that's to me, reusable really boils down to. Um, I know the fewest details about how I'm going to how I'm going to be used. And I depend on the fewest details of the things I need to get my job done. Yeah. Yep. And the more the more details I know about, the more I rely on my context, and the harder it is to reuse me. Okay. So the opposite is probably going to be true. To make me easier to reuse, you have to make me know less about. So make things depend on me instead of me depending on things. And when I have to depend on things, let me depend on the most abstract thing possible. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. So. That, that's, and again, that's, that's the exact opposite of uh, the, the typical story slicing kind of approach, which is actually trying to make the most assumptions you can about how things are going to be used so that you can find the shortest shortcut. I don't have to build a generic, I don't have to build something that solves this generic problem. I just have to build something that solves the, the small part of that problem that you have right now. Right, okay. And, and that's, that's where BDD is the most powerful, powerful is, is in helping us figure out what is the smallest part of that generic problem that absolutely needs solving right now. Let's, let's solve that first, and then, and then we'll, we'll use that solution. solution. We'll, we'll try to live with that solution for a while. Then, then we'll figure out what parts, what missing parts are the most urgent, and build those next. And then live with that for a while and figure out which urgent part, which missing parts are urgent, and build those next. Okay, yeah. And that is not the approach for building. A framework or a toolkit. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. So, so that, that I think is really the big thing. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, dude, this is awesome conversation. I appreciate and it. Awesome, awesome for me too because you're helping me articulate something that I've kind of known but not had the occasion to really think through. Yeah, this has been just amazing. So yeah, I really appreciate it. It's really uh, no problem. So, so what I saw, so just like I, I told you before we before you booked this. this. Mm -hmm. So I have been recording this. That's fun. Um, I'm not. I'm. I, I'm not going to use it as is or anything, but this is probably going to be fertile ground for some. Uh, hey, you gave me the advice. That's no, that's no problem. Like that, so I'm probably going to do that. Sure, help other people. So, and I'll take, and I'll probably end up taking the concepts and using it in some training. Yeah, totally. Some future. Totally. Um, so, what you can do is obviously uh, use whatever part of this is actually going to help you in your day job. Blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and and I'm curious to see what the next level of questions are going to be. Yeah. So then yeah. Go, go back to the J Brains experience, pump some more questions. Got a few things to try, that's for we'll sure. See. So okay, absolutely. All right. Well, thanks. Appreciate your time. So you got it, man. All right. Talk to you All later. right. Have a good afternoon. Me too.